It is so good to be with you. Um, we are um, it's just, man, what a year. <laughs> I think you'll agree. What a year. And so it's just, it's just good to be um, together. And so I want to greet uh, all of you, of course, but especially those who are new and, uh, and those of us uh, or those of you joining us online. We love you. Lots of love your way to our extended family, and uh, which is a, a larger group than normal with all the, the COVIDs and everything going on. So um, yeah, so we miss y'all uh, a lot. And, um, you know, and kind of uh, something that's been on my mind, I'll get into our new series and things we're kicking off in just a second, but um, this has been, I mean, it's, it's been a year, but really it's been even just a, a week. Lots going on um, between the, um, the shooting in Minneapolis, the Dante Wright, there's, uh, and then the kind of continued um, kind of anti-Asian violence and things that's been happening in the country. Um, and then we had, I was actually on was it Facebook or somewhere a few hours before, and I, I just heard about there was a, an active shooter situation in Austin, Texas, right? Um, I guess close to the Arboretum there or something. Um, and then there's other active shooter things going on, you know, in the country. I mean, it's just like, goodness gracious. And that can all be um, really heavy. And, uh, and I know we kind of all, you know, track it at different levels. And so um, maybe some of you, you know, are like, you're very emotionally resilient and you know, you're feeling okay. And maybe others are just like, it's really heavy. And so before I kind of got into the rest of the message and everything, I wanted to um, just kind of, um, I think, just give us a little space just for just a minute of like some quiet, which can feel a little bit awkward. I get it um, in, you know, a space like this. But man, if there's anywhere we should be able to like come and um, kind of lay our burdens before God and be okay with a little bit of quiet, I think it should be church, you know? Um, so, um, we'll do that. I'll, I won't take super long, but I'll, we'll just have a little quiet, and then um, I'll pray, and we'll kind of get into the message. Sound good? Okay. Lord, we cast all our burdens on you because you care for us. You see us. You sustain us. And by your love, we trust that you will carry us through. Lord, so we lean into you and we say yes to everything that you have for us, for our communities, our families, the people we love, where we trust that you'll sustain us. So give us full hearts, God. Give us courage to face the days. And may um, bitterness, may fear not be allowed to, um, to have its grip on us, God, but may we step into your freedom as your sons and daughters. We love you, Lord. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thanks for taking that time. So um, we are kicking off a, a new series tonight. It's titled uh, New Normal. New Normal. And uh, it, felt, it felt like a, uh, just an appropriate time with the year that it's been. Um, it, it kind of, it, yeah, it felt like a good time for some reflection. Um, because I know a lot of people had very different experiences of this this pandemic. Um, I spoke, and, and as a pastor, you know, I get a little a little kind of behind the scenes look in ways. Because I remember a week where I, I believe it was in the same week or maybe back to back weeks, but it was real close together. I talked with one person, and they were a single person, and they had at this point it was months and months into the pandemic. So this would have been maybe July or August or September of last year. And they had been working from home, and they were they had basically been alone for months. 
Um, some of that was already, they didn't have like a really strong social system, but even apart from like what little they had kind of, you know, withered and they were, um, you know, just, I mean, completely alone. And in that same time, I had another conversation. This was with um, someone who had like the young kids and the whole family. And so for them, it wasn't so much loneliness that was their challenge. They were just overwhelmed because they were like constant. It wasn't so, many, so much like big social scene, but it was more like they were never away from people, especially their kids, you know? So it was sort of like people, people in their little house and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm being driven crazy. Like I need space, I need quiet. It was so fascinating to talk with these two people, you know, same pandemic, two very different experiences. Uh, and, and another time I remember one conversation with someone who for them, like um, from a job perspective, they were able to work from home. Honestly, the whole pandemic thing was like, kind of a win in ways like it it um they were able to work from home it was less travel you know the whole thing talked with someone else it was job loss it was financial ruin it was i mean it's just the worst and you get these sort of wild swings and i think probably most of us probably somewhere in the middle or maybe strangely both at the same time you know where you have these on the like i know our family um we have had we really before the pandemic we were so busy um, which will be a message. I think it's probably next week. We'll get into that. Um, so busy, just going so fast and furious. So for us, those first few months, like, was honestly, it was, it was good. That family time was amazing. Um, and, uh, but I know, you know, again, other people, though, like, lost people, family members, friends. Like, it was incredibly difficult. So I think, um, and for us, I can say even our, fi- our family, like, financially, this was a challenging year. Uh, my wife Maggie teaches piano lessons. She had to like transition, try to teach five-year-olds piano through online. You know, like not. Yeah, she's shaking her head. Like, uh, uh-uh. uh. It was not easy. <laughs> and then, of course, we launched the church about four months before the pandemic. <laughs> so, awesome timing. So, um, so it was just you know it was a, it was just a lot. It was like it was beautiful. It was terrible. It was like all the things. That can anyone relate to that? Like. It had some upside, like, wow, some amazing moments, and, oh my gosh, that was, like, the worst. Let's never talk about it again. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of the paradox of this season. So my, where my mind's going is that I think we kind of have a tendency in a difficult season to want to just kind of move on. You know, like, let's just move on. And the thing is, we learn, or the only way that we grow is in the reflecting. The only way we glean what God might have for us is in that reflecting. The only way we have a more healthy new normal is taking some space for that reflection. So that's what we'll be doing uh, in the the coming weeks with this new normal uh, series. So uh, with that in mind, the title of my message tonight is People in My Way. People in My Way. And uh, I'd like us to do some reflecting on what's maybe one of the more um, obvious insights from the pandemic, I'm kind of framing it in the negative in the title, but to put it in a more positive, I think, you know, it's, it's kind of um, the beauty of community, the goodness of, of connection. Um, I mean, how great is it to love and to be loved? Uh, and that, I think, um, yeah, it's such a gift, and that was really kind of driven home uh, for me in, in, in fresh ways. Um, that I'll unpack in just a minute. I, I'd like to start though, with this text. This is 1 Corinthians 13. Um, this is quite a famous passage read by, at many a wedding. Um, it's from the Apostle Paul, so you, you might recognize it if you've ever been to a Christian wedding. Um, and of course, Paul's not talking here about um, romantic love per se. It's not, it's not like what he's focused on, but that's often how it's applied. Um, now, there is a strange little phrase he uses. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels which might immediately catch you like, what is he talking about angels? So if you're, if you're at all familiar with um, kind of the, um, the gift of speaking in tongues, this is kind of common in the like Pentecostal charismatic wing of the church. It's sort of this ecstatic speech, this filling of the spirit, and then out comes this language you don't understand. Um, I grew up in kind of a charismatic um, background, so I'm like, this is like, these are my people. Like, this is my world. Um, I don't know how it's striking. Some of you are like, that is the greatest thing I've ever heard. Uh, it's in the Bible, and uh, at least for me, it doesn't, I don't know, it's not strange at all, <laughs> but, uh, but I get people have different experiences. Now, what I think is interesting about where Paul takes this is um, he is, it's interesting, you can kind of hear, as we'll read in just a second, he is kind of, he's offering a certain critique, because what you can hear is basically him naming um, even if I have these amazing spiritual experiences, 
even if I, I don't, speak the language of heaven itself, which is like, wow. You know. But where does it go? But I do not have love. Then what? I am a, these are great, these good metaphors here by Paul. I am a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Have you ever had uh, maybe someone have to do like drum practice in your house? Or if you have little kids and they're like banging on the, and it's, I mean, what's that a picture of? I mean, he's basically saying you can have amazing spiritual experiences. You can like just be awesome. And yet if you don't have love in your heart, not only is it nothing, which he'll say later in the passage, we'll get to that um, towards the end of the message. Not only is it kind of nothing or it's like a mute point, a moot point, I should say, but it's actually annoying. Isn't that interesting? Um, so I, I lean, in terms of just personality, I lean more towards the introverted than the extroverted kind of side of human personality, um, which meant that in the early months of the pandemic, honestly, I was okay. Um, if you ask me, like, oh my gosh, Brett, was this so hard? It was just so hard not to be around, like, people, and did you miss us? Okay, I did. I did. I miss you guys, but... I wasn't like, you know, crying. I was like, it was okay. I was like, okay, because partly I have a very people-y job, and honestly, I'm an introvert living in an extrovert world. You know, it's sort of like, come on, people, people, being social things, and, you know, kids going to their things. So honestly, those early days, like, it wasn't, I don't know, it wasn't so bad. Uh, I kind of I liked it. Although, here's the thing. It, it was fine for, like, three months, Somewhere around like 12, 14, 16 weeks. After a while, like it started to sink in. Any other introverts have this experience? Or like the early days, like, okay, you're doing your puzzles and, you know, chilling and <laughs> watching your Netflix, right? But at some point, you know, for the extroverts, it was in like three days. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to go crazy. But, you know, introverts are a little different. And this is how it would happen. It just kind of hit me. Like within around, this was probably May, early May of last year. So like, oh my gosh. I need to be around people, and it just basically what started to occur to me was that I had, basically, I had been taking people for granted, um, because I just always had hugs and handshakes and, you know, like the thousand little ways, eye contact and like human connection. I just always had more of that, like, than I could have ever dreamed in my life, and so it wasn't until it was taken away that I realized, oh my gosh, I've been taking people for granted. I realized, honestly, this is bad as a pastor. I had taken church for granted. I remember back in November, I came, actually sat right there, and I attended a service here at Pleasant Valley United Methodist Church on their Sunday mornings. This is the place, obviously, we rented out in the evenings. Um, so I came because we were, um, myself and Sarah Johns, we were kind of scouting out to see, like, how they do things because we were hoping to kind of reopen sooner, and then the numbers went, like, boo, and so that didn't happen. But we were kind of scouting out hoping. And so I remember sitting right there, and, like, I could have cried, like, just to be, I mean, it, it was, and it was, like, you know, pretty sparse, kind of like we are, like, just a few people, you know, nothing crazy. It weren't, like, 100 people all of a sudden. It was just, you know, 20, 25 people. And I was like, oh, my gosh, and the band's, like, music's playing, and just people are talking to me before and after the service. I'm like, hi there. Yeah, hey. Like, it was amazing. I realized I had taken church for granted. Um, another experience. I had this just a few weeks ago. I went to uh, my nephew's first t-ball game. I was there in Wiley, Texas. And we went out and we sat. And I, I mean, again, I just realized I had taken all this for granted because we're sitting there. It's like people are smiling. It's a beautiful day. We're like cheering on the little kids. They're doing cutesy things, you know, and it was like this sense of kind of camaraderie. Here we all are like, yay. And, and before the pandemic, I was just like, oh my gosh, another game, another kid's game. You know, I was good. I was a terrible person. I was, I was terrible. And just to be there with other people, I saw people I hadn't seen in a year, and they're just like, hey, and I'm just talking. Oh my gosh, I had taken it um, for granted. Even meetings, like business church, or in my context is church, but you know, you'll have you know, like business meetings or things. I, and I realized even the way all that, of course, or a lot of that has been online now, 
but to be able to interact with someone. Like, what happens before and after a normal meeting? Even if you have an agenda and things to do, what do you do? You chit-chat before and after. You know, just like, hey, what's up? How are you? I, I, it wasn't until it was all taken away that I realized, oh, my gosh, I have taken it all for granted. It was all precious. It was all beautiful. I'm so grateful. Like, I didn't realize. It's the old cliche, right? Don't know what you got till it's gone. Like, it was, that was exactly the experience um, that I had. I'd been taking people for granted. And so, here's the question that I've been kind of mulling over the past few weeks. Um, what if it's not just me, or even I see a few of you nodding your head, so assuming you know, a few of you are connecting with this. Um, but what if it's not just me and not just us that have been doing this, but what if really as a culture, long before the pandemic, what if we have all been very prone to take people for granted? Um, in other words, what if we have often seen people, or maybe I'll just say too often we have seen people as somehow in the way of our life instead of them being the precious way that is our life? Does that make sense? Like, they, they're not in the way, they are the way. They're not in the way of my life. They, like, are my life. Like, these interactions, these, these people, you all, my family, my friends, my, right? Like, people, like, this is so much of our life. And honestly, this is how God, like, meets us. And yet, um, so often, and I'll just speak in the singular here. I'm not trying to put it on all of you. But too often, I have seen people as in my way. Um, here's a story that plays out over and over and over again in our, um, in our culture. Um, a person, they work at a job for like a long time, you know, 25, 30, 35 years. And um, the whole time, they thought the primary point of their job was what? The job, right? Like doing the things on the list. And then they have like their retirement party. And, you know, people show up and like see all the people. And then suddenly it dawns on them that all of these people that they, you know, had spent quite a bit of time being mostly annoyed with, <laughs> but all of a sudden, what do they realize? Like, it hits them, right? That what was the most beautiful, meaningful part of the whole thing? What was it, I should say? Who was it? It was the people, right? It was the relationships. It was the, it was the connection. Like, that's what it was actually really about, or at least... Um, even, I mean, I'm not saying to-do lists don't matter and things, right? You have your job, you got to do your job. But I think the point is we just too often we get so distracted and so focused on I've got to get somewhere, I've got to do the thing, I've got to succeed in some way that it's like people are in my way instead of they are the way. They are the way. Here's another um, story that plays out over and over and over again in our culture. Uh, you have a parent, and they have an amazing job. I mean, it's one that people envy. They, they, they do very, very well. But like every job, has its trades, has its trade-offs, and the trade-off is uh, it's long hours. And even when they are home, um, they just they don't have much to give. Right? Emotionally, it's like they've kind of given it all elsewhere, and they get home, and the kids are like, let's play. You know, and they're just like, oh my gosh, I just don't have much to give. Um, and the story they tell themselves to kind of justify it is, well, I am providing a life for them that they would not have otherwise. And honestly, they need all of these things, all these things that I give them. They, they need all the fancy things. Um, but what is that? What's that parent like? What are they missing? What's the primary thing? Like, what's the primary gift of a parent? It's not a big, like, fancy check, is it? What's the primary gift of a parent? It's their presence. Not, you know what I mean? Presence, E-N-C-E, -E, presence, right? It's the, it's the connection. Like, that's, that's the thing. The, the family's not in my way to some other goal that, like, is really important. Um, they are 
the way. And of course, I'm not trying to like shame anyone. I get life happens. Sometimes you miss, you know, you miss Susie's soccer game or you have the crazy week and you work late or busy season or whatever, right? My point's not to shame, but maybe I'll just say, if you haven't been to Susie's soccer game in two years, it might be time to rethink the priorities. But we keep forgetting this, don't we? We just keep drifting from this truth. And why? Because the culture keeps drifting from this truth. And it's like, it's sort of like the tide. We just get pulled right out with everyone else into thinking, into the the great lie that people are in our way rather than them being um, the way. And I think um, the way I want to kind of break this down tonight is in two ways. I want to look at two traps, because I think this happens. I'm not, I don't personally I don't really believe in the whole sacred, secular split of the world. I think this is God's world. God is present everywhere. There's you know, nowhere you can go where God is not. But I do think for shorthand, it can be kind of a helpful way to think at times. So I'm going to talk tonight about the, a secular trap and then a religious trap, two ways that this plays out, uh, and then I will be done. Um, so here's the first The first trap is the secular trap. This is when wealth, titles, and status become more important than loving relationships. And this is the way I think it plays out in kind of a more secular space. Um, Wealth, titles, status, right? This is what we start to pursue, and this is why people become in our way, because we're like, we're going onward and upward towards these awesome things that, you know, actually people really respect, and uh, that's what I'm going for, right? Um, there's a, a wonderful book. If you haven't heard of this book or gotten it, you all should. Though I know not everyone's a reader of books. But if you are, uh, this book is wonderful. It's titled uh, A General Theory of Love, written by psychiatrists um, and co-authors Richard Lannon, uh, Fari Amini, and Thomas Lewis. And they basically um, they, they do pull a lot on neuroscience to talk about the ways that our, our brains, what they call the kind of limbic part of our brain, this kind of... Um, uh, emotional feeling part of our brains, how it it connects, it syncs up, it links up with others through things like hormones, through body language, mood. Basically, it says it's all contagious. Some of you have ten- tonight, like you've caught certain emotions from people that you've interacted with. You didn't have to think about it. It just happened. This is why when someone like greets you and they're smiling, they're like, hey, oh my gosh, it's so good to see you. You start to feel better. You can't help it. Even if you're like, no, I'm going to be angry. You can't help it. A smile, a right? It starts to connect. And the reverse is true as well. And so what they do is they kind of, they wrote this brilliant book talking about how this happens, how um, it impacts, you know, parents to children have a powerful effect on their kind of emotional state and what becomes their emotional normal. And I mean, they just unpack. This is why, um, for example, therapy works. You get into a relationship with someone who, hopefully, if the therapist is good, is emotionally stable, empathetic, a good listener, and you start to tune into them. Now, where they also go, and the reason I bring it up now, is because they name um, why our society dangerously ignores this process, all of the relating and the loving and the connecting, why we ignore it to our peril. This is a lengthy quote, but I think it's, it's worth um, reading in full. They say this, Um, Relational pursuits sink slowly and steadily lower on America's list of collective priorities. Top ranking items remain the pursuit of wealth, physical beauty, youthful appearance, and the shifting, elusive markers of status. Does that sound familiar to anyone in the culture? Like, yeah. There are uh, brief spasms of pleasure to be had at the end of those pursuits, the razor-thin delight of the latest purchase, the momentary glee of flaunting this promotion or that unnecessary trinket. <laughs> you can tell they're being a little brutal. But if you've had that moment, right, of like, ooh, the new thing, it lasts for like 24 hours, you know. Pleasure here, but not contentment. Happiness is within range only for skillful people who give the slip to America's values These rebels will necessarily forego exalted titles and glamorous friends, exotic vacations, washboard abs, designer everything, (laughs) all the proud indicators of upward mobility, and in exchange, they may just get a chance at a decent life. What, What are they naming? They're naming the secular trap. 
they're naming the way that we are all tempted. Oh, and social media just takes this and puts it on steroids. Because now we're all projecting. We're all, even if we don't have it, we can pretend. And so now it's like, yeah. I mean, have you heard of people doing advertisements where they like, they rent a Ferrari, they get a bunch of fake money, and then they like make ads based on like, I'm successful, buy my video series on how to be successful. And it's all fake. It's all fake. They rented the helicopter or whatever, you know, like. And this, this is what we're projecting, this wealth, status, because huh, huh, that's going to be a great life. It's the secular trap. It's a trap. It's, it, in the end, it, there's so much emptiness there because the real meaning, the depth, the beauty of life, where is it found? In loving and being loved. People. Relationships connection. That's where all the good stuff is. And hey, if you get a helicopter, I mean, good for you. Congrats. That's <laughs> but, but without love, remember the passage? Without love, it's nothing, right? Now, you might say, well, here's the thing, Brett. I agree. That is so shallow but I'm a religious person, a spiritual person, a Christian person. I don't go in for all that, you know, outward success and the trappings of, you know, looking good on social media. Oh, forget all that. I'm into other things, you know, spiritual things. And of course, this takes, this. there's a, a lot of different ways this plays out. There's more of like a Christian-y version of this religious than there's like, um, and even different flavors of Christianity people do. There's then kind of a more new age spiritual kind of way to do this. There's all sorts of ways that we fall into this religious trap, but I'll just give a few bullet points to kind of like start hitting on it, you know. So I don't care about that secular stuff, Brett. I care about things like biblical knowledge, positive thinking, Christian tradition and orthodox belief, spirituality, realizing my higher self, activism, bringing about the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven, attaining higher states of spiritual consciousness, praying a lot, meditating a lot, spiritual disciplines to become the best me that I can be. Any of that sound familiar? Like, Brett, you've preached on some of that. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. I'm not saying these things are bad, but what happens, right? If there's a, a secular trap of wealth and status and like, that's the most important thing, then we, it's weird. We kind of invert it and like we do a, a religious version of this. Um, and so here's the religious trap, just to give you this clear definition. This is when biblical knowledge and rule following and religiously motivated activism and my endless self-improvement projects become more important than being a loving person in loving relationships. That's the trap. And I fall into this trap. Um, here's my, one of my most embarrassing moments as a person who calls themselves a Christian. So I am, this especially happened back when my kids were younger. Um, they're getting a little older, a little better about knocking now, but I would be in my, my, little, my little room, it's the piano room, and that's where I say my prayers in the morning. So I'd be like either praying or reading scripture, doing my, you know, Christian devotional kind of thing. And there I am in the morning, and one of my kids would just burst in, and they're just like, hey! Oh, sorry, that's a little loud. They're like, hey! And they're like, I need water, you know, or some request at 7 a.m. Just, oh, I need water, I need this, I need that, and I would, and I'm like in the zone, you know, I'm in the zone, and I would be like, <gasps> I would just get so, I think it was probably because that's why, that's my own little me time. It's my me time, you know, and I just felt <laughs> my space, I'm an Enneagram 5 for those of you who care about such things, so this is probably part of the reason is how my center side comes out, and I'm just like, get out of here, like, get out, and I would kind of like, I would get real upset. Now, why is that so um, stupid and embarrassing? Because the whole point of my Bible reading and praying is supposed to be what? Loving, <laughs> right? I am supposed to be the place where the love of God is happening. And so it is just the absolute height of 
my ego and stupidity that in that very moment where I'm literally, I mean, often my prayers are, God, fill me with your love. Transform me. God. Like, this is my prayer. And I'm like, get out of here. You know, like, what is going on? It's the religious trap. It's the religious trap. And of course, to be clear, I'm not saying, you know, that memorizing Bible verses or marching for justice or whatever you want to, like, obviously that list, those are, those are beautiful things as long as they're leading you to a place where the love of Christ is happening in you and me. Then it's awesome. That's great. But the moment we start to think of people as in our way to some higher ideal, some other thing, whether spiritual or whatever, that's, that's when um, we've lost the plot of the story. That's when we've, we've lost um, our path on the journey. We've fallen into the religious trap. And this is why the Apostle Paul warns us of the religious trap, 1 Corinthians 13. I'm going to keep reading. He starts with verse 1 that we already read. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I'm only resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains. There's echoes there of the teachings of Jesus, right? If you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can move them. And Paul is saying, if you have that, you can do, you can do that. But do you not have love? Nothing. I'm nothing. And if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain Nothing, because what is love about? Which is, say, what is God about? Love is patient. It's kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. I think that's a key word for all we're talking about in the secular trap, the religious trap. What happens? It, you, you can even seek the self, yourself, even in church. <laughs> but true love is not self seeking. It is not easily angered. That's the word to me. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And that's what true Christian spirituality is all about. So in closing, um, never forget People are not in your way. People are the way. So don't fall into the secular trap of thinking people are in the way or the churchy religious trap, spirituality trap of believing people are in your way. They're not in the way. They, they are the way. And if, a, man, if we've learned anything from a pandemic and a year of way too much isolation, it's the goodness of connection, the value of people. And so... And as a community, let's do our best to learn the lesson. Sound good? All right, let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, I thank you. Um, I thank you for this community, and I thank you for the love um, that is in, in so many of these people's hearts. And God, I pray that this year, this next year, God, you would deepen it, that we would learn all that you want us to learn, and that we wouldn't um, that we wouldn't take people for granted anymore. God, yeah, help us to value, help us to treasure people as the marvelous, glorious, beautiful end that they are. Help us to love well. God, that's our prayer. It's in the powerful, life-changing name of Jesus that I pray. Amen.